Gin gets its name from the Dutch word for juniper. Of course, juniper berries are the predominant flavour in gin. Gin's popularity began in the 1580s when Dutch soldiers shared an early version of this drink with the English soldiers who'd come to help them in their war against Spain. This is allegedly where the term Dutch courage comes from. A century later, gin's production got a major boost when the Protestant William of Orange abolished taxes on the drink in order to discourage imports of spirits from Catholic countries. In 1736, the Gin Act was implemented in England. This levied a massive duty per gallon on the gin retailers, and the result was widespread rioting through the streets. The gin trade simply went underground. The duty might have existed, but gin drinkers managed to get theirs duty free. Gin and tonic is probably one of the world's best known drinks, and it's also one of the oldest. G&T started out as a health tonic, and quinine, which is the key ingredient in the tonic part, it's not actually a cure, but it has been used since the 1600s as a way to reduce the fever associated with malaria. Now as the British Empire grew, so did the consumption of gin. Soldiers took it with them to their far-flung outposts as a way of reminding them of home. In malaria-prone areas such as India, it was found that the gin and tonic was an ideal way to take the required daily dose of quinine to prevent illness. It was also found that quinine dissolved much better in gin than it did in water. And with a wedge of lemon or lime, it helped to disguise the quinine. Thus, the gin and tonic was born. I have asked my mate Titch Hay to tell us about the various styles of gin and also the regions where it comes from. Well, Titch, I understand there are a couple of gin styles or main styles, what are they? Yeah, basically uh, in Australasia there's two gin styles as we know it. There's firstly London Dry Gin, which is the more dominant English style gin. Uh, and then secondly, which is probably lesser known, uh, but if you cross the English Channel to Holland and Belgium where they call it Geneva, which is a slightly different style of gin. Okay, so, so this gin here is an example of a London gin. Yeah, Miller's, Miller's is, a, is a great example of a classic London dry gin, um, but Miller's is also a super premium gin, which is sort of the, the next stage up in a lot of categories entering the market now in the, in the gin sector. What are the main gin regions and how would you characterise the gins that come from those areas? Uh, there's a variety of gin regions throughout the world. Uh, the United Kingdom, uh, which produces mostly uh, dry gin, which is uh, from Colin Stills. You have Holland and Belgium, which uh, produce Geneva, which is mostly from pot stills. Uh, Germany, which produces a Geneva style gin. Spain, which uh, produces a su substantial amount of um, gin, all probably in the London dry style. And then the United States, which is the biggest gin market in the world, uh, and they produce an American dry style gin. We managed to find our way to the Cameron Bridge distillery, which is just a wee bit north of Edinburgh and at Cameron Bridge uh, they make a few different products that are familiar to our shelves in New Zealand and uh, we've got Sean here with me, he's one of the distilling chaps and he, uh, he's going to tell us all about it. I'm great, hey Sean. Nice to meet you. Alright, great, let's, uh, let's head off. I asked Sean from the Tanquery Distillery to take us through the main botanicals that are used in making gin. Here's a few snippets of our conversation. Juniper berries mainly come from Italy. Um, the ones we use, we get them from Tuscany, which is the northern side of Italy. Um, but they can come from Macedonia, Serbia, Yugoslavia, Croatia, all that sort of region. Right. I mean, people think juniper is just used for, for making gin, but it's not. Um, Juniper is also used for smoking meat and fish, okay. giving it some flavours, also used in your cooking. Yeah. Um, so as, as various uh, 
various uses. Cool. Okay, let's just stop there. Coriander. Um, there's two different types. The coriander we mainly use, it comes from Romania, um, Russia, and also Bulgaria. They're the best places they're grown. We also get, obviously you can see they're Moroccan. One, one biggest thing that you see there is the size. Yeah, it's little. It's little. And also what you will find, you can pick up again and crush into your hands. You'll find that the Moroccan coriander is more, more citrusy than the coriander from yeah, Bulgaria, Romania. So. Got almost quite a strong lemony, lemony, yep, limey sort of, yep, lemon lime. Sort and if you if you if you try the Bulgarian, Russian, and Romanian, you'll find that it's 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 lemony, but there's a herby type of smell. Yes, it almost reminds me of that um, uh, lemon pepper sort of plant. Smell uh -huh. there. Mm. Now. Coriander is farmed, uh, and I should say about 90% of coriander grown in the world is used in the actual, um, should we say, spice industry, right. i.e. your curries, right. a lot of cooking, um, and the, the rest of it goes into things like making gin. Angelica root comes from mainly Germany and Belgium, and this is how it actually grows in the ground. Okay. okay. Now we have it chopped up because we have to pass it through pipelines. Yeah. Now the sort of smells you get from here is we say it's like a dark chocolate cocoa type smell. A bit like doggy chocolate. <laughs> I know it sounds weird but it's a bit like doggy chocolate. But it can also smell, smell sweet, can smell of curry. There's all various smells that you get from, from Angelica root. And Basically, what this ingredient does when you, you mix them with the other ones is actually marries the coriander and the juniper okay. together in the still. One of the other ingredients that we, we tend to use a fair bit is liquish powder. Now, liquish powder comes from China. Cinnamon and cassia bark. Okay, they both come from the same plant family but they've got completely different smells. I mean, most people know the, sm the smell of cinnamon. Mm. Now, one of the other ingredients that we would use is orange peel, which being a byproduct of the actual orange juice industry, and we use actually Seville oranges. Sean unveiled the difference between gin and vodka. What makes vodka actually different from gin? Okay, well, well vodka is your, is your neutral spirit and your neutral spirit then would go through a process um, maybe through carbon filters, may go through charcoal columns, could be distilled um, and there's no actual natural ingredients used, it goes through a process. Yeah. Um, with gin, we actually take um, raw materials, the botanicals uh, your junipers, your corianders, your angelicas, um, and then place them into the still and actually distill them with the neutral spirit um, to actually turn it into the gin. Um, so vodka is is neat, uh, grain neutral spirit, yeah. but it would have gone through a process, um, which is completely different from making gin. Lawrenceburg, Indiana, on the coast of the beautiful Ohio River, and I'm standing here with Larry, who has kindly offered to take us around. Larry is the master distiller. He's been here since 1982. Hi, Larry. How are you? It's nice to meet you. Diane takes care of the botanicals in the cold room, as well as weighing out according to formula, and based on the formula that we're producing. And we actually produce a couple formulas, one for Seagram Gin and also for Burnett's Gin. But she'll weigh it out according to the formulation and put it in again into the charge boxes and then these boxes go into our gin still. These are some of the botanicals that we have in the inventory. Uh, the most expensive that we have is actually the saffron. Okay. 
and that's uh, used in one formulation that we uh, export. What, what actually is that? Is it a tree bark or something? Or? Saffron is actually the pistil out of a crocus flower. Oh, wow. So it takes a lot of crocus flowers to make that much saffron. Yeah. And if you buy that in a store, that much of it, it'd probably be a week's uh, paycheck. <laughs> These are about, careful with that. <laughs> about $500 a pound for uh, saffron. Uh -huh. But all of these, we do have an inventory, like I said. Um, we run a distillation with the botanicals when we receive them to make sure that they are meeting our requirements and they match the reference that they originally sent us. Uh, we're not running it right now, of course, but um, we take the botanicals, we soak them in neutral spirits, then we run a distillation. All of the distillation for our Seagram Gin at this plant is done under vacuum. So we actually run these stills under vacuum also. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And in that essence that comes off and the oils come off with the alcohol is then sent to our quality lab where they'll uh, match it to the reference and prove it or reject it. And then we either receive the botanicals or go ahead and send them back. So the vacuum yeah. still process must be quite a bit more efficient than the regular. What happens with vacuum distillation is it allows you to produce the gin at lower temperatures. Um, oh, right, of course. Instead yeah. of uh, grain neutral spirits boiling at about 172 degrees Fahrenheit, under 24 inches of vacuum, uh, the alcohol will actually boil at about 125%, 25 degrees Fahrenheit. And what I refer to that is not bruising the flavor. Right. With all the organics you have in there, when you subject them to high heat, you'll have a tendency to burn the distillate. Right. And at lower temperatures, you don't have to worry about that. This is a control room for all of our mashing, which is the cooking for the two processes we have here. We not only make neutral spirits, we also make bourbons and straight whiskeys at this location. And the uh, other controls in here are for the, all the distillation that goes on on the other side of the, uh, outside the room. The uh, system that we have here is under vacuum for making the gin like I, like I said before and also we have three gin stills. We produce all of the Seagram gin is sold domestically in the, in the U.S. right oh. here and, and we are exporting into Europe. Oh. The um, capacity of the distillery is essentially five million cases worth of uh, gin in a year's time. It's what we can produce here. Seagram's Gin presently sells right at 3 million cases in the U.S. Oh. It is the largest selling gin in the U.S. The controls are computer controlled. They're batch sequenced, if you will, so that the operator starts this process up. Throughout the process, he's monitoring the controls and the controls step the process through. Gin is a batch distillation. We fill the kettle with neutral spirits. We add our botanicals right into the neutral spirits so they're recirculated through the system. We reduce the pressure by pulling vacuum, thus getting the alcohol and botanical and oil mixture to boil at 125 degrees Fahrenheit as opposed to a higher temperature. We collect our product off of it, which remains the flavors that we do not want. We then return that mixture to the neutral spirit unit, where we clean up, take the flavors out, and then uh, reclaim the alcohol, so we reuse the alcohol. In a day's time, we produce approximately 17,000 cases of uh, gin. Well, the gin's drink. Larry took us through the main stages of the process. That rolling action is all part of it. When you're down at beam, can you taste any of this stuff? The activity that you see in there is actually from the yeast. Yeah. 
Larry also showed us the barrel mellowing operation. The Seagram gin, after it's produced in a distillery and quality approved, is then pumped over to be stored in a barrel. These barrels have been used for straight whiskeys once. They've been used for light whiskeys at least twice. And they're used for our gin five times. So the gin is actually put into the barrels and we palletize them so they're sitting on end. Uh, they're filled on the far station. They move upstairs. They're stored upstairs for about three months. They're brought back down this elevator and then empty. And if it's a, only the first use, then they're used four more times. So it's, the system is cycled up and it's stored. And what happens is it mellows the flavor. Right. It goes from the, the typical gin flavor as it comes off the still to a little mellower flavor coming out of the barrel. It also adds color to the gin. The Seagram's gin has a little golden color to it. Yeah. And that comes from being stored in the barrel for about 90 days. The best price is unique in the Seagram's It makes it very unique. I'm not sure anybody else wants to take the time yeah. to put it in a barrel for 90 days. Yeah. But this brand was developed that way okay. back, I believe, in the 50s. It's only when you visit these massive plants that you begin to get an idea of how big the global liquor industry actually is. And this plant was primarily for the U.S. domestic supply. 